Today on the Save to Gen Z, I discuss Canada's economy with the Honorable Tony Clement. Well, I happen to be the last uh, government minister who took government spending seriously. I was president of the Treasury Board of Canada under Stephen Harper from 2011 to 2015. I don't think we should do a massive lockdown again. The, the impact is too huge. Our economy could not survive that. You know, I, I believe in the dignity of a job. I believe in uh, the dignity of work. I think that's the best social program uh, ever envisaged by humanity is actually a good job with a good pay. Hi, and welcome to the show. Due to COVID and as Trudeau's out of control spending, Canada now has a $343 billion deficit. We have also lost our Fitch AAA rating and national debt is hitting the trillions. Now, that's a lot of money, so it's worth talking about it. And today I have the incredible honor of being able to speak with the Honorable Tony Clement, a man who has dedicated a large portion of his life to serving the people of Canada through our political system. He was first elected as a PC MPP in 1995, where he served under Premier Mike Harris here in Ontario. He then ran for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada in 2003, but lost to Stephen Harper. But that didn't stop him from being involved in federal politics. And in 2006, he was elected as a member of parliament for Prairie Sound, Muskoka. He served in the House of Commons until 2019. During his time as an MP, he served many cabinet positions in the Harper government, including Minister of Health, Minister of Industry, and President of the Treasury Board. Since leaving the House of Commons, Mr. Clement has been advising a drug company, as well as running his own podcast and his own show called Boom and Bust on the News Forum. His show focuses on economic issues. And today, he joins my show to talk about all that money that Justin Trudeau is throwing out the window. Before we get started with our interview, please subscribe if you haven't already and consider hitting that notification bell. All right, so... Um, Mr. Clement, thank you so much for joining me today for an interview. It's my pleasure. Uh, so maybe how about we start off with you uh, maybe telling us a bit about why you initially got into politics and uh, what you've been up to since uh, you left politics last year. Well, one never really leaves politics, uh, I got to say, but uh, certainly many years ago when I was 14, 15 years old, uh, I was living in a time when... Pierre Elliott Trudeau was the prime minister, and uh, I saw uh, how it was abridging rights and freedoms. Uh, socialism was on the march around the world, and uh, they didn't uh, approve of people making their own decisions in their lives. And so, uh, I mean, in a sense, I'm a reactionary. By that, I mean I reacted to the world around me and about how freedoms were being taken away. And I wanted to be a freedom fighter. I wanted to be someone who, who wanted to advance freedom. And uh, that was really the start of it. And uh, I got involved in my first election in 1975 in Ontario, the Ontario general election. And then I got involved in federal politics. When I got to, when I got to university, I was very involved in campus politics. And it just snowballed from there. And uh, I, I feel like it's been part of my life. And it still is part of my life. I, I have a much more varied life now because I have a number of startup uh, operations that I'm involved in in the tech sector and in the healthcare sector. I do a lot of media. I, I host my own TV show and my own podcast. But uh, one really never leaves politics. And uh, so I was very involved in the, the conservative leadership election, which... Uh, was uh, just finished. So uh, yes, uh, uh, that's my life right now. That's good. Um, so you did mention you have your show and you talk a lot about finance on that show. 
So, uh, you know, as you know, Canada is not doing uh, very well financially right now due to uh, Trudeau's mismanagement and as well as, you know, COVID. Uh, and now we have a $343 billion deficit. Uh, do you think that a conservative government could have had a lower deficit? And if so, how much lower do you think the deficit could have been if the government was responsible with its spending? Well, it really is a dire situation right now because the economy isn't bouncing back as quickly as it, as it cratered when we had the lockdown. I think, to be fair, any government of any stripe, when faced with COVID, would have done the same thing, would have locked down. The issue is how quickly can you bounce back? And that's where I think a conservative government would be different from a liberal government. Uh, and uh, their, uh, the liberal approach seems to be uh, to rather than to try to get businesses going in a COVID safe environment, uh, their approach seems to be keep the free checks coming. And, uh, you know, I, I believe in the dignity of a job. I believe in uh, the dignity of work. I think that's the best social program uh, ever envisaged by humanity is actually a good job with a good pay. And that doesn't seem to be the direction of the government right now. So uh, my best advice, and I've already proffered this advice to the new leader, Aaron O'Toole, we have to be, as a conservative party, we have to be a working class party. We have to be a party of the working class, people who work for a living, who aspire for themselves and their families to get ahead. That, that's the people we should be championing. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, most people would, you know, stack, uh, on spending after announcing a $343 billion deficit. But Justin Trudeau is planning to do the complete opposite of that. He wants to spend billions on, you know, green economic energy programs and stuff like that. Uh, do you, Why do you... What do you think are the long-term consequences of Trudeau's out-of-control spending? And why doesn't he consider these long-term consequences when he's opening the checkbook of Canadian taxpayers? Well, he seems to be very focused on the short-term, not the long-term. And uh, the, the impact of that will be felt by future generations, including your generation. I'm, I'm 59 years old. I, I can protect myself and my family, I believe, from uh, ridiculous uh, government decisions. But... At your age and the, the age of your viewership, it's a lot tougher because you, you still have, you know, you still are aspiring to an income for many years to come. So that's the first problem is, is that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you know, he thinks it's a short term political solution for millennials and Gen Zers to, uh, to get their vote. But uh, I, th I think when I look at, uh, your uh, your generation, uh, you deserve long term solutions as well, and that's that's what we're missing. So, uh, an alternative conservative government has to speak to that, has to speak to uh, Gen and Zetters and uh, and uh, millennials and uh, what they're going through. Uh, and uh, you know, your generations haven't lived through some of the. The long-term effects. Uh, I remember them in the in the late '80s when interest rates were 15, 18 percent. My the mortgage on my house had a mortgage rate of 15 percent. Now it's five percent and under. So if the long-term impact of all this spending is interest rates go up, that's that's been the historical record. So uh, and that means it's a lot tougher to make ends meet. It's a lot tougher to pay pay your bills. This is just around the corner. I'm not trying to be a doomsayer. I'm just saying that's that's the cycle that that the government is allowing us to get into. So we need some very critical lateral thinking on this and very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, with Justin Trudeau's uh, newest scandals that have taken a hit at his popularity, it is very likely that the next government will be conservative. Uh, so in your view, how should the next conservative government cut back on spending? And do you think that big spending cuts, uh, which means, you know, a loss of public service jobs or a loss of social programs will be necessary? Well, I happen to be the last uh, government minister who took government spending seriously. I was president of the Treasury Board of Canada under Stephen Harper from 2011 to 2015. Stephen Harper gave me a difficult but necessary role. He, he asked me to review every single program, 
to do a massive program review. It was called the Deficit Reduction Action Plan, or DRAP. And uh, we found uh, savings of 9% of, on program spending. I exempted a whole bunch of things, healthcare, safety, veterans, those, those uh, environment. Uh, I said, we're not going to try to find the cuts there, but there's enough in the other programs to find uh, reductions in spending. And we reviewed 650 individual programs to come up with uh, our recommendations to Prime Minister Harper and to Joe Oliver, the finance minister. And uh, it was done pretty well without a hitch. No one felt any pain because we were very surgical and focused on our reductions. And the result was uh, very, very positive for, for the balance sheet. So I know cuts are a bad word and austerity is a bad word, uh, but I, I think a re any reasonable person would say, how can we deliver government programs better? And how can we ensure that in the future that we can live within our means? Because the impact of not living within our means is also very detrimental to people. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, most people would not uh, go into crazy spending if they don't have money. So, no, the government shouldn't either. Uh, so a popular program by the Liberals has been uh, the uh, CERB, uh, but this program uh, was very costly, and now it's discouraging people from going back to work because they can make more money sitting on their couch. Uh, do you think that uh, the government uh, should have come up with a better program uh, to help out-of-work Canadians during this COVID pandemic? Well, look, uh, we needed to do something. I get that, I, I, but I've looked around the world. I look at the UK, for instance, that has Boris Johnson, a conservative uh, prime minister. They came up with uh, income supports that were timely, that were effective, and that were temporary. And the key word is temporary. Now, the message from the British government is get back to work. I have heard no message like that from the Liberal government, nothing. No message saying it's time to get back to work, it's time to resume our lives, of course, with safety protocols in place, et cetera, but uh, nothing like that. It's like uh, Government of Canada is here to, to basically give you a, a universal basic income without having not, not having that debate in Parliament, not having a debate in society about that, because uh, there are very much minuses to UBI as well as pluses. Uh, and uh, so this is very discouraging. And uh, we, we as conservatives have got to find a way to engage the public on that issue without appearing to be mean. You know, Trudeau is praying that we'll be against uh, CERB or the UBI in a mean way. We're trying to take something away. We don't care about people paying their bills or being able to spend on their children. That's going to be his message. We have to find a way to counter that message uh, and uh, deliver a message of compa compassion, uh, but also a, a, a message that is sustainable for the future. No, it's 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 true because I mean Justin Trudeau has an advantage here. He's like, I'm giving you free money, and you know somebody like uh, the conservatives who want to say get back to work. Well, maybe voters are like, no, I want free money. But if you go at it from a compassionate point of view and saying like this is not how we should do this, maybe probably voters will understand a bit more where conservatives are coming from. Uh, so in the midst of this pandemic, uh, US President Donald Trump has decided to reimpose 10% uh, tariffs on Canadian aluminum. Um, what effects uh, do you think this will have on the economy, the Canadian economy, and as well as on Canada-US uh, trade relations? Yes, and I've had discussions with the Aluminum Association of Canada on this on my Boom and Bus program on the news forum. So it's very, very timely as well as a, as a U.S. former Republican congressman, John Faso. He was a guest on my program as well. And uh, both think it was most unfortunate that these tariffs were resumed because it's not only the tariffs, it's the counter tariffs that the Canadian government had to, and I, and I get that, they had to do something, they couldn't just let it go. But the counter tariffs uh, also mean that products that are produced in the U.S. and exported to Canada, like refrigerators or beer cans or whatever, they're more costly to produce, and therefore the cost of living of Canadians as well as Americans is affected by that. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is a one-off thing that will be resolved after the next election, regardless of the result, uh, the next uh, U.S. election. 
Um, and the funny thing is what I learned in my research on this uh, is that uh, the, the number one uh, organizations that benefited from Mr. Trump's tariff were a Swiss company and a Russian aluminum company. Uh, the rest of the aluminum producers in the U.S. were against the tariff. So hopefully this can be resolved after November elections, uh, regardless of the result, with either Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump, and then we can be on our merry way. Yeah, that, that's, actually, that's actually very interesting. I didn't know that um, you know the Russians and the Swiss were benefiting from these tariffs. I guess it's a bit similar to how most corporations like more regulations because they can afford to pay it, but not smaller businesses. Uh, so as COVID cases drop and uh, businesses uh, start to reopen, uh, government and politicians are talking a lot about economic uh, recovery. In your view, uh, how can the federal or provincial governments uh, best help the economy recover uh, from the worst downturn since the Great Depression? It is really unprecedented. And I, uh, as a former public policy maker and government minister, I have a lot of, uh, and a former health minister, both federally and provincially, uh, I know how difficult this time is for policymakers. Uh, having said that, they owe the country uh, the plans for the future. And uh, those plans should be a rapid uh, improvement to our, our businesses, uh, opening the businesses as much as possible with the appropriate uh, things in place, uh, safety procedures in place. We have a lot of businesses open now, but some are still not open the ones who are uh, have more mass uh, uh, attendance, like live events, uh, sporting events, those, those kinds of things, but also uh, other other mass events. So we have to come up with a plan for that. Uh, and um, uh, the other key thing, Eli, and this is something that your audience must understand, is we've got to radically change our supply chain. And by that, I mean, where do we get the goods and services that are inputs into our economy or the outputs that we send uh, overseas? Right now, our supply chain is China-centric. It has to change. It has to be away from China. It's called the great decoupling. You'll hear that phrase, decoupling our supply chain from China, which clearly was not uh, a trusted partner during the COVID crisis, uh, uh, get, get uh, locally developed personal protective equipment. Uh, I'm involved in some of my business opportunities with PPE supply chains that are away from China. Uh, critical minerals, another critical thing. I wrote an op-ed piece on this with uh, my friend John Faso, the former U.S. congressman. Critical minerals that are used for uh, uh, solar panels, but also for defense purposes, and also for you know uh, other ally alloys that are used in our everyday lives. China is trying to corner the market on critical minerals. We have to develop a separate supply chain on critical minerals. Those are just a couple of examples that has to be a top priority for any Canadian government. No, I'm totally with you on that. We have to rely less on China for many reasons. Also, they're very unethical. We see the way they're treating um, Christians and the Muslims in their country right now. Uh, the way they basically lied about this pandemic and created a global health crisis. I mean, if we continue to support that, then you know, how how can we criticize countries uh, for not supporting human rights when we give them all this money? Uh, so uh, government lockdowns were uh, one of the primary primary factors that like directly harmed the economy. Uh, if a second wave hits uh, Canada, do you think that government should reimpose these lockdowns, or should they instead uh, uh, look at following the, the Swedish model, which allowed for the con the economy to continue running while still protecting the most vulnerable people. I, I guess I'm sort of in the middle of those two extremes, if I can call them extremes, uh, nor uh, can we, we don't know enough about the virus to be assured that a herd immunity approach is necessarily the best approach. What I would do is basically what the UK is doing uh, and some other countries uh, around the world, uh, France, Croatia, Greece comes to mind, uh, is when you have a specific outbreak, isolate that I, I was outbreak, track and trace that outbreak, do a lockdown locally. Australia has done the same thing in Melbourne, Australia, for example, and the state of Victoria in Australia. Lock down a province or a state uh, or a city 
but don't lock down the whole country and then focus on that uh, that outbreak, get it behind you and then uh, lift the uh, the barriers. So that would be my recommendation going forward, because I, I believe COVID's going to be with us for a long time. I'm not convinced a vaccine is going to be universally uh, available nor universally successful. It'll have some success, but to think that there's a magic wand that you just wave it around and COVID disappears, ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have to learn to live with it, but we have to develop the protocols when there are these outbreaks that we know what to do. So uh, let's finish off this interview by talking about the conservative uh, le leadership race, which uh, left all of us going to bed at 2 a.m. last <laughs> night. Uh, Erin O'Toole was elected leader and Leslie Lewis uh, got a third of the votes on the second ballot. Uh, what are your thoughts on the results of this uh, very different in, uh, leadership race? Well, well, I was a backer of Aaron O'Toole, so I was very happy uh, to see him uh, triumph on the, the last ballot, 57% of the points. Uh, and uh, obviously very happy with, uh, uh, with Lesslin Lewis's, uh, uh, also her conduct during the campaign and her results. I had an opportunity to talk to both Aaron and Leslin uh, since the leadership vote. Uh, so in the last uh, 24 hours, and uh, I have offered to help Leslin if she needs any advice on where to look for a seat, because we need her in Parliament right away. She's a great, uh, a great politician, some really interesting ideas. Let's get her in Parliament and get her to be part of the team. The key for Aaron O'Toole right now is part of unity, get the caucus uh, unified, get the party apparatus unified and focused on the next election as quickly as possible. And I know that's what he's doing. No, and for sure. And I was very impressed with Aaron O'Toole, even though I didn't vote for him. He came on my show. He supported independent, independent media. He talked to social conservatives and more progressive conservatives. I think he will do a good job at United in Country and beating Justin Trudeau in the next election. Uh, so, Mr. Clement, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming on today um, and doing this interview. And I... Uh, wish you the best with your show and uh, the other um, things that you're doing in your life. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be on your show, and I wish you every success as well. I hope that you enjoyed this interview. If you did, make sure to give a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to learn more about Tony Clement, check the links in the description of this video. Thank you, and God bless.